Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Multifamily Man podcast powered by Total Web Academy. I'm your host, Angelo Webb, and today is the uh, third and final little segment that we're doing on due diligence. Um, And today we're going to talk about legal due diligence um, and also understand that some of this stuff is fluid. Okay, Um, this due diligence. This isn't like a hey beginning to end. Uh, some of these, some of these things happen. It's a bunch of moving parts, and these moving parts are all moving at the same time. Um, so a lot of this stuff comes at the same time. So I don't want anybody confused to think that some of the stuff you're doing before you're handling some of the legal side of it. Okay, um, but this is just um, these things are the things that need to be checked off this list on the process. All right, so uh, we're just gonna hop into it. Uh, legal due diligence. Um, again, you should have. Um, legal representation, right? You should have a lawyer that specializes um, in real estate to help you with this, or be working with a broker who has that um, have those services at their office and is maybe and there's something that they provide while you're doing this. Okay. So, first item that we have on the legal due diligence is get a copy of the purchase contract to the lender, the attorney, and to the title company. Um, I know that sounds crazy, right? Like, of course we need to do that. But even again, even the smallest things we need to put on this list and we need to check this list off because we don't want to miss anything because all this stuff is vital. So the first thing we want to do on this one part is this is really one of the first things you do in general after doing like your preliminary due diligence, not your official, just trying to see and identify if this property, um, if the property is a good deal, you know, after that. And you write you write the LOI, the, the letter of intent. Once you have that purchase contract, we need to get a copy to the lender, the attorney and the title company. All right. And once we get that, we're also going to the second thing, we're going to send the earnest money to the title company. Never send earnest money to a broker. Or to a seller, the earnest money goes directly to the title company always. There's no exceptions to this rule. OK. You do not want to get burned. All right. It goes to the title company. Let the title company do their job. They'll do everything they need to do. They'll protect it. They will they will they will protect you. Okay. Always to the title company. All right. And then the next thing is going to be a preliminary title review, report review. So what that really is is just they kind of do a quick title review. They make sure that it's not tied up um in any litigation. Um uh, they make sure that it's not um you know, brother, sister, cousin, any of that kind of stuff that are also on the title or make sure that it's not a cloudy title. OK, um, I have seen deals fall apart because there was a third cousin who also had, you know, who also had rights. Right. They may not have been gaining anything financially from it. They may not have wanted anything to do with it. They may not even known that. They were part owner. It is maybe grandparents left it to them. Right. And excuse me, grandparents left it to them and they have to sign off on everything. Right. So this is going to get all the heirs or any owners and everything involved to make sure this starts to clear. Right. That's just a preliminary report. Um, Do you want to secure your title insurance? It's always important. Don't ever skimp on that. You don't want to be holding a bucket. Um, Then we're going to uh, obtain a property survey. Um, which is very important because we want to make sure that what we're buying fits on what we're buying. I have seen cases where half of one building was not on the proper survey. It wasn't on on the survey. It shows it across the property line by four or five feet, or there is amenity that is across that property line by two feet. Right? So, we need to know we need that survey to make sure everything is where it's supposed to be make sure that we're on our lot make sure that um you know you have the you know every every property has so many feet that it has to be from the street we're making sure all of that stuff is is kosher right and we're making sure that that is all good all right Uh, and that's the purpose of the property survey uh the next thing is going to be the environmental compliance um and that's kind of self-explanatory too. Um, we want to make sure that the uh, environmental surveys pass, right? The last thing you want is to have an environmental issue um, because that can shut everything down. Depending on what's going on, if 
if, if that doesn't pass the sniff test, um, if you don't take that step and get that approved, it can bite you in the ass because it can turn around and something can be wrong with the soil, right? It could be an environmental issue. And next thing you know, the city's saying that nobody can live there anymore. And here you are sitting with this apartment that you've invested into, your investors have invested into, and there's no income. There's no revenue, right? All because we skipped a step, right? So we want to make sure that the environmental, um, the environmental, and uh, is in compliance, right? The the everything the the environmental study is lining up with what's appropriate. Um, and when you get it, you probably won't understand what it says. You just know if it's okay or not. Because I read a ton of them, hundreds of them. I could not tell you what any of it meant. I just know that they said it was good or it was bad. It's super scientific. I mean, it goes in the, I mean, they start with chemistry and all kinds of stuff. But you want to definitely get this and make sure that it passes that phase one. All right. You want to get the current insurance policy. You want to get a run loss report for any fire, flood or liability claims. OK, so this this is a legal thing because it's insurance um, tied in with kind of the physical and financial altogether. But uh, you want to get that from the insurance policy. So you want to know, hey, has there been a fire? Right. And we want to make sure that that repair was done properly. Has there been a flood? What caused the flood? Are we in a hundred year flood plane? Are we in a 500 year flood plane? Or, you know, what, what's going on? Was it structural? Was it, you know, sewer line? What caused the flood? All right. Again, understanding what problems were in the past. So we know if they're recurring problems or there are one time issues that were fixed and know that, hey, if they got if you see. In a certain part of the property or in a certain building, they have multiple claims for flood, it's probably a sewer issue. Right. And it might be a belly in the line. Right. You might have to get somebody. You might have to get your plumber out there, a couple plumbers out there, um, run a camera in the line and see what's going on. If there's something wrong with the line, you'll know, hey. We're going to have to fix this issue so this does not keep happening. Or again, hey, plumber, how much does it cost you to fix this? $50,000. Hey, seller, this is going to cost us $50,000 to, to fix this line, this sewage line. We want that as a repair credit, right? If they don't want to get the repair credit, tell them, well, hey, we're going to have to take we're going to have to take 60000 off our asking price, right? So. Um, that's how you want to look at th that's why those uh, the current insurance policy is important and those run loss reports are important you do want to review the service contracts if they're having uh, laundry landscape HVAC etc again these are these are contracts they're legally binding agreements correct so you want to see you want to see what they're spending uh, and in case of laundry what they're making Right. Um, so you want to see these contracts. So, you know, again, you can verify you trust what they tell you, but verify it. Um, and these numbers should all match up to what they say. Um, as far as laundry goes, um, if they're partnering, if it's with a local laundry company, if it says that they had a hundred dollars a month in laundry income, the contract should show how and why. Right. So that should all add up. All right. Landscape. If they say they paid a thousand dollars a month to a landscaper. The contract should state that. OK. Or if it's more than what it's stating, maybe there's um, some extra things that they did. Right. Maybe. Um, hey, this wasn't in the contract. However, they did, you know, change out a grassy little grassy area. Um, and we made a flower bed, right? Or we mulched it. Uh, all this stuff, you should see all that stuff. All, everything that they do, every dollar should be accounted for through the contracts, okay? Um, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to want to um, obtain copies of all surviving guarantees and warranties, right? So any work that was guaranteed, any work that was done that was guaranteed, need all of it. Any um, work that was done or um, appliances that were bought, any of that stuff to have warranties, you need all of it. 
they should have all that stuff on file. That stuff that should be at the office. Because honestly, even if it's there, it doesn't mean they're using it, number one. But number two, this is one of those things that can save you on your expenses, right? If we know that 10 units got brand new refrigerators from GE and they got warranties, why are we buying parts? Why is our why why is our maintenance team bothering it? And they have a two year warranty, right? So that that's another weird way to uh, see some opportunities. Like it's a brand new refrigerator. Why why do they spend any money on a part when there is a warranty covering it? Okay. Same thing with roof work. Same thing with plumbing. Same thing with electrical. Same thing with striping the parking lot. If there's any guarantees. Or warranties to their work, you have to have accesses so you know in the future that if you can use those versus using the budget, okay? The operating, coming out of operating budget, okay? Um, you want to match current zoning with current use. Kind of talked about this um, in the last podcast. It does not always match up, but we have to make sure that it's current, okay? And we have to know how much it's going to cost and the time it's going to take for us to get it current. Some cities are absolute stickers on a lot of things and they may not allow the purchase to go through or they could be big jerks and say nobody can live here. We're not issuing an occupancy permit for any apartment or this property until it's zoned correctly. Just like that. Your revenue is gone. Is that extreme? Yes. Will it happen? Probably not. Have I seen it happen? Yes, twice. They were smaller properties, but at the end of the day, it's still the same thing. That was somebody's money that they invested, money they worked hard for and saved to invest that almost cost them their shirt, right? Luckily, we had connections with another buyer who bought the property from them um, pretty much immediately um, and got them out of the shit storm, all right? So it does happen when people don't take all of this stuff serious, you know, sometimes people get in the process or they're done with the process and then they contact us or they contact the management company. Your management company that you're going to use should actually be a part of this process. Even if it's a management company that you're going to, if, if it's the same management company that's at the property, if you're going to keep them, again, I'm kind of iffy on that because why is a property in the state it's in, right? But if you have another company that you're going to use, they should be a part of this process and they will help you through this. All right. Um, the next thing is local code compliance. Big issue. Right. If there's a bunch of code violations at this property, you know, you can buy it, but then you're responsible for those violations. Right. If they're not in compliance with a lot of things, you have to get that done. You know, you will you inherit any problems here. Right. Um I would say I've seen this happen a few times too, right? But we had an investor who literally went after the properties that had a lot of code violations, right? You know, so they say they know like, hey, if they have code violations from a year ago or they have multiple in two or three years, they don't have the money to take care of this stuff. They probably are in a position where, um, they want to sell it and we can buy it at uh, at a good price and make a great investment. Right. Um, but know what you're getting into. Right. If the decks um, behind the building are correct and they're in compliance and, and they're not in compliance with the code. Know that. Right. And get your people out there. Get your deck guy out there and uh, or gal out there. Have them give you a bid. Right. And call two more. Have them give you bids. OK. Um, so coding, you know, knowing what they are, uh, you know, where they are as far as code compliance is important. Ideally, they don't have any code violations. Or if you're looking for stuff that has that kind of deferred maintenance because, you know, that presents a huge opportunity for you. You want some, but nothing major. OK. And the last thing that we're going to see uh, or get for the legal due diligence is we're going to get the current staff report in lists of employee benefit packages. Why is this important? We all know why it's important, but, you know, it's one of those rhetorical questions that I have to ask. Why is this important? 
because we want to make sure that two things we're not overpaying people and we're not underpaying people guys and they may not have crossed anybody's mind but the biggest issue in our industry right now is maintenance workers right maintenance supervisors maintenance techs everybody i don't care what multifamily group you get on on facebook i don't care what meetup you go to everybody's gonna ask you the same question are you having fun are you having trouble finding maintenance people yeah and i'm gonna tell you why because you're paying them crap that's why now if somebody has to choose between unclogging shitty toilets and flipping burgers they gonna flip burgers if it's it if it's the same price because when they flipping burgers they're not on call right they don't have to stay extra long because somebody's apartment flooded so when we're talking about people being underpaid or when i talk about people being underpaid understand this is mainly maintenance and don't get me wrong you know us office fam that's where i come from you know the office is where i started as leasing agent a lot of times are underpaid as well and overworked. But a lot of times it's okay because we do get commissions, right? We get commissions on new leases and renewals. So we kinda we kinda kinda grin and bear it, right? Maintenance don't doesn't see these things. And a lot of times they're severely underpaid. Um in my portfolio, my maintenance supervisor and my property manager usually made the same amount, which was unique. But we didn't have any freaking maintenance issues because our maintenance team was paid what they were worth, right? They were happy to come and do the work. They were happy to put in their best because we were paying them appropriately, right? So that's why getting the staff report and understanding what their full benefit package is, what they're getting paid, do they have insurance, um, you know, are the... um, members of the maintenance team getting paid mileage if they're getting called in after hours or on the weekends we need to know what those benefit packages are because what is going to ultimately set us up for success and this is the last thing i'm talking about so i'm gonna go a little bit deeper into it ultimately our on-site staff is going to be the difference between success and failure understand that okay understand that the frontline workers are going to be the difference between your success and your failure as an investor as a management company they make everything go if they are not being paid well things will not go well we have to make sure that we're paying them well paying them appropriately if if we can get them you know as many benefits as we can even if they have to pay for some of it ideally some of the stuff at least themselves we cover and then if they want to add the spouse and children if they have a spouse and children you know then it goes up right and then it might come out of the check for them but we want to provide them with some of these basic things if we want our team happy because our happy team is what is going to make this work. I cannot stress that enough, right? And this is not some weird socialism stuff or far left stuff. It's none of that, okay? Um, This is about doing what you should do for your property to work. And what I can guarantee you is if you treat your on-site personnel like gold that property will be worth its weight in gold i guarantee you you get people there that know what they're doing and you treat them right and they will take care of you all right they will take care of you i promise you treat that on staff right they're happy They're joyous about the job. So when those hard times come, which will come because they come in every situation, every facet of our life, they come. So when you treat them well, 
and the residents are giving them headaches. There's not a manager in this world. There's nobody who's ever worked on site that's not going to tell you that the residents are headaches. Loved 99% of my residents, but it's a headache. It becomes a headache some days, and sometimes you're tired. But when you're happy and you know that the owners have your back, they support you, you can get through those times because you know, hey, I am being paid well for this. Hey, they understand that this is stressful, right? And they're compensating me appropriately, accordingly, right? So please, please, guys, please pay your on-site guys and gals appropriately, especially our brothers and sisters in the maintenance department, all right? It's, it's hard work and maintenance, okay? And they need to be paid fairly. Sorry to rant on that, but that is my biggest issue in our industry is maintenance being underpaid, all right? So, and I'm going to tell you another kind of example of why it's important. Because you all have a maintenance tech who has an HVC, you know, that has their HVAC license or they are electricians or they're plumbers or they're all the above. Do you realize that they could go into one of those industries and make significantly more money? And that's why we lose them. Somebody who's a plumber can make $80,000 a year, no problem, working for a plumbing company. But you want to pay this tech 40000 a year. Like, it just doesn't add up. I'm not saying pay them 80. But what I'm saying is don't pay them 30, right? Give them compatible, uh, c- compatible wages. Like, it, it has to be... It has to be competitive. And if it's not, you're going to lose them. All right. So that was the last thing with the legal due diligence. And I am a stickler on that. Make sure you are paying your on site people properly. And on the flip side, make sure you're not overpaying. All right. Pay what's fair um, and they'll take care of you. And ultimately, they they take care of you by taking care of your property and taking care of your residents. Right. And then that asset is taken care of, which means your investment is taken care of, which means your investors investment is taken care of. And ultimately, that's what it's about. Right. It's providing, you know, providing a great product, a great place to live, safe place to live for our residents and growing our wealth, growing our capital and our long term wealth over time. Right. And that becomes a win, win, win. And if it's not a win across the board, then I, I don't think it's a win at all. All right. So, again, this um, this was has been the last uh, part of our due diligence little, I guess, mini series. <laughs> um, again, if you guys have any questions about this stuff, please feel free to email me at Angelo at Total dot com. Also, if you are a investor who is investing in multiple property in multi properties, a multifamily properties, excuse me, which means six or more. If you're a syndicator, um, if you owned a real estate fund and you invest with syndicators, please reach out to me. I would love to have you on the show so you can share your story with us. Right. I mean, ultimately, what this is about is being um, part informative, part inspirational. Right. Um, so I would love to get some people on more people on so they can tell their story. So how they started. Um, and again, this isn't to brag or boast. It's to inspire because there might be somebody like God Lee. I'm in that same situation. They did it. You know, I can do it. And this is what they did. I'll take those steps. Or maybe they'll say, hell, they in the worst damn position I was in. Right. So if they can do it from that position, I can do it from my position. So it's all about um, informing and inspiring everybody. Uh, Again, thank you guys for joining me today. And again, this is Angela Webb with the Multifamily Man Podcast, powered powered by Total Wealth Academy. Thank you for joining. Have a great day.